The term feminism may have been coined in 1837, but its spirit extends far before that. So, what woman throughout history might be considered to be the world's first feminist? Well, for my money, it's this woman. Well, we all know who this fat slob of a mental case was. And you may have heard about his first wife, Catherine of Aragon. But how much do you really know about her? Because in many ways, she was even a greater historical figure than the fat slob ever was. She was born in 1485 in Aragon, Spain. Her mother was the legendary Queen Isabella I of Castile. Catherine was highly educated. By the time she was 11, she could read, write, and speak Latin, Spanish, Greek, and French. She also studied law, history, math, geography, and theology. When she was 15 years old, she was shipped off to England to marry Prince Arthur. But just a few months later, Arthur died of sickness. Since there was no precedence for a woman to rule England, Catherine was married off to Arthur's brother, Henry. Her wedding and coronation took place in June of 1509. By all accounts, she made a fine impression with the people of England, and that impression would only grow greater throughout her entire reign. Four years into the new reign, trouble erupted across the English Channel. At the Battle of Spurs, the French Duke of Longueville was taken prisoner and sent back to England in chains. Henry put Catherine in charge of the prisoner while he crossed the English Channel to fight the French. The Queen had the French Duke placed in the Tower of London while she turned her attention to another pressing matter, the Scots. At the border with England, the Scots were stirring up trouble while Henry was away. They must have thought Catherine wouldn't be much to worry about. But they were wrong. Incredibly, even though she was five months pregnant, she still clad herself in armor, mounted a horse, and rode north to lead the troops herself. The ensuing battle was a victory for the English. The Scottish King, James IV, was killed. His body was snatched from his kinsmen, and Catherine was now beginning to gain a legendary status. All the same, she tried to give her husband all the credit. But over in France, a less than successful Henry was not amused. His jealousy of Catherine would mark the first crack in their marriage and even in his own psyche. But Catherine was undaunted. Being the devout Christian she was, she continued on with her queenly duties. And as if she needed to boost her popularity among the people of England even more, she started a massive charity for the poor. But I know what you're thinking. All this certainly does earn Catherine the title of a great historical figure. But how does it make her a proto-feminist? Well, everything so far doesn't. But these next two point of facts most certainly do. From 1507, Catherine held the position of ambassador of the Argonese crown, making her the first female ambassador in European history. Now let's just think about that for a minute. She was the first woman to represent a nation in the entire history of the Western world. Now if that isn't breaking a glass ceiling, then I don't know what is. Hell, it was actually more like a cast iron ceiling. Education for all women, regardless of social class and ability. Women's progress is essential for the good of society. Women are intellectually equal, if not superior to men. Those words were published in 1523 by this man, Juan Luis Vives, 
He was a Spaniard living in Holland, and in his day, he was as renowned as he was controversial. Some historians call him the father of modern psychology. He was the first to identify what we today refer to as delayed stress syndrome and repressed memories. His research into memory, learning, emotions, and perspectives, and early medical practices were groundbreaking. But his book on the education of Christian women was in some parts of Europe downright scandalous because it was the first book ever written defending women's rights to advance. Juan was a close personal friend of Catherine, and the queen had only one surviving child, a daughter she named Mary. She seemed to be concerned about the girl's future, and considering who the father was, that's not very surprising. So Catherine commissioned Juan to write on the education of women, which is why the book is dedicated to her. So this, more than any other reason, is why Catherine of Aragon deserves the title of proto-feminist. She had a book written to defend not just her own right or the rights of her daughter, but that of all women. And that, more than anything else, is the very essence of feminism. Mary would grow up to be Queen of England, despite all her father's efforts to delegitimize her, including keeping her separated from her mother during her youth. But such was the love and renown that the English people had for Catherine. They risked their own lives to smuggle letters between mother and daughter. Catherine of Aragon died in 1536, age 50. She lies in Peterborough Cathedral with the inscription above her grave reading, Catherine, Queen of England.